Well, hello and welcome once again to Pale Blooms and Beyond. Thank you for joining us today. Pamela Morgan is a Canadian musician, recording artist, and songwriter, as well as owner of her own label, Amber Music. She was the lead singer of Celtic folk rock band Figgy Duff from 1976 to 1995, who really put Newfoundland on the musical map. Through many miles touring and the release of five albums, the band have shared their folk rock style with many a fan. After Figgy Duff, Pamela has recorded under her own name on her own label. Ms. Morgan now lives in St. John's, Newfoundland, and Labrador. Well, welcome, Pamela. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Pleasure is mine. So you were, were you born in, in Newfoundland or where, where were you born? Okay. Yeah, I was, I was born in central Newfoundland. My father worked in the paper mill there. One of the few places not on the coast. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, so you were more inland, in Newfoundland inland. Well, yeah, that's where I grew up. But you know, we I went to St. John's after, which is the only real city in, in Newfoundland. So, uh, I I moved there when I was a teenager and been kind of there ever since. Okay, okay. Do you have uh, fond memories of your childhood? Oh yeah, absolutely. It was wild. Uh, the, it, the interior, uh, that that landscape is beautiful. Virgin forests and big rivers and, you know, uh, gorgeous nature. Yeah. Very, very picturesque. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you remember um, music being played in the house when you were young, when you were little? Oh, yeah. My mother was a piano teacher and she taught in the home. So her students would come to the house and we heard music, you know, from the time we got home to, from school until eight o'clock in the night, like various students coming through. And plus I had three older sisters who all played the piano and uh, mom played, we all played and we all sang. Oh, well, how, how interesting. So there was always a lively lilt going on in the household. Um, yeah. So you just mentioned your your uh, your mother. How about your your father? Was he uh, musically inclined? No, he couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. He <laughs> he had no no musical uh, musicality whatsoever. So we were all very lucky that we took after mom in that regard. <laughs> Can you remember going back a ways? The first single or first album that you ever got. Um, I didn't get albums. My sisters had albums. Uh, so there was always albums around, like, you know, LPs around the house. Um, I remember the first, uh, well, the first albums that really struck me. One was a John Baez album, and the other was called Go Go 66. And uh, it was a bunch of uh, different, various artists uh, with music from the 60s. And uh, I, I love both of those. And then uh, and other ones I remember from that time, we had Tommy uh, in the house, like the album Tommy um, and uh, Jesus Christ Superstar yeah. and uh, just various things like that that I remember from that time. But it was mostly my sister's albums. I never really bought them. Well, you didn't really have to. You could just borrow them from your sister. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you, what um, do you remember as a teenager? Uh, what artists or, or bands that you really liked? Uh, I I didn't really follow you know pop music that much. Mm -hmm. So um, like it, it was just really the albums that were around the house and some of the things that were on the radio. Uh, I always was drawn to uh, Motown. Uh, like oh, okay. I, I really like the uh, the black music I was hearing, like the Supremes and stuff like that. Um, I uh, and I was uh, pretty heavily influenced by classical music because of my mother, and uh, you know, so I I, lis I listened a lot to Love Chopin and you know things like okay. I, I just my my musical influences are a little bit 
eclectic like they're all over the map kind of thing <laughs> I did I, I, I was never really a, a fan or a follower of any particular band as such and, and and when I got to be a teenager I started to get really interested in Newfoundland music like the folk songs so uh, when I when I met the the, the boys in Figgy Duff uh, they introduced me to uh, bands like Fairport Convention and Steel Eye Span and all that and um, I was really mm -hmm. intrigued by all of that because it was you know we had our own source of that of those songs we didn't have to get them out of books we could learn them from people and uh, so we could do the same thing with our own music as they were doing with British folk music so that really captured my imagination in my later teens. Right right well what uh, instrument did you learn to play early on? Oh, piano from, from the time I could walk really. But uh, then I picked up the guitar in my teens. Mm -hmm. And then did I play you... a bit of whistle. Ah, okay. yeah. did you take any lessons there or just self-taught? I, I, had, I had piano lessons all, all up growing up, but uh, self-taught on the guitar. On the guitar. Yeah. So when did you, what age did you begin to take an interest in uh, folk culture, especially Newfoundland and Labrador? Well, the thing was, is that when I was in high school in the 70s, there was a big cultural renaissance happening, like, you know, Newfoundland writers, um, playwrights, movie makers. We were all, uh, there was a groundswell of trying to reclaim our uh, culture and um, to defy the stereotype of Newfoundland that was prevalent at the time. We, there was the image of the stupid Newfie and being kind of, um, you know, like everybody got to have someone to look down on. Well, we were that for, for Canada. And uh, we were, uh, so there was a huge kind of groundswell of defiance about that. And so, since I was a musician, I went looking for the Newfoundland. I knew there was a lot of beautiful Newfoundland ballads. There were some that were well known, but there was a wealth of them under the surface that had never been, you know, they'd, they'd never been brought to public um, interest. So the, I was keen on doing that. And I was doing that research before I ran into the figured off crowd who were doing the same thing. Okay. But I was doing that when I was in high school. Yeah. Okay. Um, what what subjects did you really like in in high school? Uh, well, literature and drama. <laughs> <laughs> well, those uh, helped you later on, obviously. Um, yeah. Now, did you <clears throat> after high school did you attend Memorial University? No. No. Okay. I had read that some not not saying that you had, but I had read something about it, their folklore department. That well, had. I have an honorary doctorate. Okay, okay. That's they gave they gave me an honorary degree, an honorary doctorate from Memorial, but I never attended university there. I left my grade ten and went on the road, and I I was on the road ever since. Okay, you traveled quite a bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so were you were you aware of Noel before uh, Figgy Duff? No, uh, because I, my interest at that time was when I went on the road on the summer of my grade 10, it was with a theater company. I was interested in drama and theater and I worked with a couple of theater companies and he saw uh, plays that I was in, in which I sang. And so he sought me out. I didn't, I didn't know, really know anything about him or his bands. I went to see, they had a band, Lukey's Boat, that was really popular when I was a teenager, but I didn't, I went to see them once at the Thompson Student Center, uh, but you know, I didn't really know them. Like he he came after me. I didn't right. really know anything about him. Okay, <laughs> you were, <clears throat> so when did you, uh, <clears throat> when did you realize that uh, you were on his radar? Uh, he approached me when we were in St. John's doing a play from, from our high school drama club. Mm -hmm. We wrote a play about the uh, the vanished uh, indigenous people of Newfoundland, the Beothic, and uh, we performed it in St. John's and he approached me then. Because somebody, a friend of his had brought him to see the play in Grand Falls where I'm from. So he knew about me, but I, I so I didn't know about him, but I was, that was when I was in high school. Okay, okay. 
So um, when this was all developing um, and, and right on the cusp of Piggy Duff, uh, I assume your mother was all supportive. Was, was your dad behind, behind your decision to get into uh, music? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, they all they wanted me to go to university like all parents did at that time they weren't happy about it especially dad um you know and and they 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 rightly said and and they they it proved to be right like you'll never make any money and um they were right <laughs> and um, uh, you know they didn't they didn't like the lifestyle they were they were intimidated by it you know and you know, I, I, as a parent now and a grandparent, I understand. But uh, at, the, at that time, you know, once you get something in your head, you, it, it, there's nothing going to stop you. Yeah. Right. You got to make your own mistakes, right? Right, right. And, and music, <laughs> it, it, it's part of your, your spirit, your soul. So you know, I hear this all the time, and I know it to be true that musicians have to live out that, that lifestyle. You know, it's, it's, it's a part of you. It's, it's who you are. So um, you have to kind of follow that that path, you know. Um, but um, I understand. I understand. You know how parents' concerns and, and you know not naturally. Interestingly enough, my mother's sister, who was married to a, a musician and orchestra conductor, uh, they lived in Berlin and they were there for many many years. She said, uh, her her quote was. Nobody should be a musician unless you can't not be. Right. I totally relate to that. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, so the band was coming together. Um, who was the one that came up with the name Figgy Duff? Who penned the, the group? Um, we shot him. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh okay <laughs> oh that's funny <laughs> oh my goodness okay <laughs> oh because because figgy i didn't ever make the connection you know i mean i've heard the old the old you know uh song you know figgy pudding bring us some figgy pudding oh bring us you know and I didn't make, but it's actually the same thing, right? Just a Newfoundland, Newfoundland version, right? Right. Like a, a well, <laughs> Duff, Duff is, is dough. It comes from dough, D-O-U-G-H, right? Mm -hmm. So dough, it's a pudding. Yeah, it's, it's figgy duff is, is a pudding that, you know, a, a, a Newfoundland dish. Yeah, yeah. But see, duff also has a lot of connotations that, that aren't very pleasant, <laughs> and uh, you know the name was there, and it, and it, and it, you, you can't kind of change your name midstream. But you know, uh, I don't think the name did us any favors <laughs> over the years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm sure it, it it got attention anyway, whether it was positive or negative. It, it, it <laughs> I'm sure. I guess, well, and and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean the Beatles, uh, you know, that's probably not their greatest name ever either. So right. you know, <laughs> true. You At, know? Yeah, yeah. At that time, they were people were probably like, okay, uh, this is not going anywhere. But um, who were so who were the original members? Of Figgy Duff. Uh, well, there was Noel and his brother Philip, Noel Din, Philip Din, Kelly Russell. Dave Panting, Art Stoyles, and myself. Okay. So did you all kind of come from the similar um, uh, influential backgrounds as far as what kind of music you liked and that, what y'all were into? Sort of. I mean, Noel and Phil were from a rock background, really, and they kind of got the idea to do the folk rock fusion. Kelly and Dave were both, uh, and and well, no, and Kelly and Dave were both learning traditional instruments. Art Stoles was a totally different uh, kettle of fish altogether. He grew up on the waterfront, and he was illiterate, and he, uh, he the accordion was his life, and uh, so he grew up learning. I mean, he knew all kinds of Portuguese tunes, mm -hmm. and you know, he learned from the sailors. He learned from everybody. He had a real great mix of music. Beautiful, beautiful player. And my background was more classical, so you know, I guess it was a mixture. Yeah. Well, I, I, but I, I, we're I, all handpicked by Noel, right? 
<laughs> right. Well, I'd say it, it, it worked out. It was a good uh, it a was launch of, of, of talent and interest. Um, then you were on the road quite a bit. Uh, and you didn't have a manager or agent at that time, right? Early on? We never had any infrastructure whatsoever, and that was to our to our detriment. I mean, you have to understand where we are geographically. Uh, I mean, in those days, there was no industry here, no industry support, no, there was no management available, there were no labels, there were no, hardly any venues even, hardly any cities. And you would have to drive, you know, 300 miles in order to get to another city to play or another town, you know, I mean, the, right. the population is very, very spread out. In order for us to get even to Toronto from Newfoundland, you know, it, it's a three, three or four day drive. It, and we drove mostly because we had the equipment. We couldn't afford to fly and all that kind of stuff. So just even to get to central Canada was a four day trip. So, you know, it didn't make sense to be going back and forth a lot. So we used to just get in the van and go on a wing and a prayer and just get gigs as we went and kind of try to, you know, make our way. It was a really tough life. Right, right, right. Well, you guys really were the pioneers in Celtic folk rock there. And of course, you didn't fit real nicely into that folk or that rock genre. So I, I imagine that made it a little difficult for people to try to label you or, you know, tag you. But um, you, I'm sure that, you know, you, you have left quite a, uh, a heritage, you know, and you, you've got to be proud of that for uh, being, being there at the forefront. I think we kind of blazed a trail for bands that came after. I mean, as you as you rightfully observed, I mean, the folk clubs hated to see us coming with our amps and our drums, and the rock <laughs> club couldn't understand the accordion and the mandolin and stuff. You know, like we, you're right, we didn't fit. You know, the places where we first started playing mostly were blues bars, because they understood, uh, you know, like. Um, that well blues is folk music you know black yeah. folk music and they kind of understood the, the the folk rock fusion sort of thing more than either strictly folk or strictly rock did so we started out there and then progressed mostly to the rock bars the folk we were never really accepted by the folk community because you know we were too loud mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do you do you recall in all of your travels um any any particular uh, gigs that you did that you really made that connection with the audience? One of you know really memorable shows that you had. Oh, there were tons. <laughs> I, can't, <laughs> I can't really. It's hard to, hard to hand pick those. I I don't know. I uh, there were tons. Well, well what about um, your the gig that you had the uh, fewest number of people? Can you remember that one? Fewest. Uh -huh. I have a photograph of us busking in some village in England, and oh. there's one uh, six-year-old girl sitting cross-legged in front of us, watching us. <laughs> okay. I've, I've heard interesting, I like to ask that question because I've heard some interesting stories. Uh, so what, uh, can you recall one of your largest uh, concerts that, that you that you performed? Um, well, some of the festivals, you know, like uh, Property and the uh, Philadelphia Folk Festival and just uh, various large festivals. Now, those audiences weren't there specifically to hear us, but uh, but we've played some large festivals over the years where there's, you know, a lot of people there. Mm -hmm. and generally, we did pretty good at those. Do you do you like playing like indoor concerts or do you like the live the outdoor festivals better? Um, I, you know, I like the idea of outdoors, but uh, outdoor festivals are really tough. Like they're mm -hmm. hard hard work because you have to beat your way through the crowds. There's no sound check. There's no 
creature comforts i mean there's there's a tent and some refreshments and stuff like that but uh usually you have to drive or or be driven through throngs of people and it's tough it, that that's a tough gig and uh, you have to go on cold and you have to have total faith in the in the crew i mean sometimes the crew is great and sometimes they're not and and especially when you're doing folk rock fusion and they don't understand what it is and so they can't you know what I mean? Like they, they don't know how to mix right. it because they've never seen it before. And and so you're there at the mercy. There's no sound check and there's no. So it's it's always kind of like high stress. You're always kind of on, you know, on adrenaline. So, you know, I, I, I in the later years, I started to much prefer <laughs> more civilized <laughs> venues with you know, when you have a green room and a you know maybe a, a cup of tea or a, and a sound check and stuff like that right? so, yeah so, uh, the, the band was signed to island records but yeah. the, first, the first album was not released why was that uh, well, we lost that uh, gig because um, uh, internal conflicts uh, we were we were uh, badly behaved and uh, um, not ready for it, I guess, you know, uh, it didn't work out because um, uh, we just weren't ready for it. Mm -hmm. I'll just leave it like that because it, um, you know, we weren't, we weren't well behaved, that's all I can <laughs> I can't get into it because it, uh, sure. you know, it's not, it's not the greatest time. It wasn't the greatest time for us. So you weren't, you weren't, you hadn't really matured, is what what you're kind of saying. No, and uh, you know, we were like, we were, we were. Well, I say we, but not so much me, but like we were scrappers. We were, we were, we had to fight for everything, and it, and it was hard, and and it was tough, and there was a lot of alcohol involved, and just you know. They were hard times, and we were we were a bit wild, and uh, we we didn't really know how to handle, you know, like record executives and how to behave and all that kind of stuff, or how to dress or how to do any of that stuff. We were just, I guess, I I mean, I guess the best way I can put it is that we just weren't ready, and uh, they backed off because it just wasn't, um, you know, worth it for them because we were too rough around the edges, um, you know, internally. Not so much the music. The music is was always great, but uh, the the back end wasn't uh, wasn't workable, shall we say? The Island album was recorded, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, on, but they gave us uh, the wrong producer, so it didn't really translate what our live what what could have been for that record. Um, there's a couple of tracks from that on the retrospective. Okay. But uh, the album itself was never released. Okay, got you. Okay. Well, I wanted to uh, mention a few tracks from the Posterity album um, and then get your take, get your take on those. Um, now I'm 64. Um, now, is that an old folk song or a tribute to the Beatles when I'm 64? <laughs> no, it's a folk song. It's not when I'm 64. It's now I'm 64. It's a song that is very well known here. People sing it all the time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But it was instrumental. We did. That was an instrumental version, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I like that one. Um, one of my favorites off of that release is the Greenland Disaster, the Ceiling Song. Yeah. What is that also an, an older folk? song yeah it's a traditional song see the, in those days we were uh you know uh, searching for lesser known songs and uh they were always sung by people a cappella, and we would write settings for them right so we made up all the chords and the and the arrangements and everything and and uh the greenland was a successful one yeah that was a nice one and then uh rosy banks of green very pretty, pretty tune. And I like the delicate piano throughout that song. Uh, what, what, what type of uh, piano was, was used on that one? That's uh, that Noel's playing that and it's a Fender Rhodes. Okay, okay. I knew it was a different sound, but a very, very, very nice. 
Nice. Van der Rohe's with a phase shifter, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. You don't you don't hear it very often. It's no. It's, or at least I haven't. And then um, Fisher, who died in his bed. That's my favorite track on 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 the entire album. I love the flute intro and outro, and of course the vocals. You know, on that one. Good. Yeah. The, uh, that's the Tim Whistle. That's me playing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, that those are just two verses of eight. Ah, okay. <laughs> so it would go on and on and on. <laughs> it's a long song. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 you know, but I just, um, I, I love the melody and you get the gist of the song with just those two. That's the first and the last uh, verse of the song. I think you do. It comes through very, very well. In 1982, you guys wrote the original score for Shakespeare's The Tempest, right? Uh -oh. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it paused for a second. I thought we were, we were going out. Um, how were the recordings almost lost? And how did you help to restore the score? Well, um, it was never officially recorded. I mean, uh, we... <laughs> Well, we tried. We we went in the studio to try to record that score after we did the the show, but again, we were you know we were always in disarray. And uh, a, a very good friend and mentor to the band died uh, just as we were starting the sessions, and we never really got back to them. And then, of course, you know, Noel passed away. So I wanted the the score to be saved. So I got a hold of the guy who was the director of the play. And he sent me four cassette tapes um, that some audience member had recorded. And so I transcribed them. I knew I, I knew how to play the things that I wrote, but I didn't remember exactly what Noel had written. But we 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 both wrote the, the bulk of it, you know, between us. So I I transcribed his piano parts and um, then got somebody to play them. And over years just piggybacking on other projects, I recorded the entire score. Ooh, and then that, that came out in 2010, right? Uh, yeah, no, I don't know. If <laughs> <laughs> it came out is a bit of a stretch. I mean, because uh, I never, uh, we, we didn't make hard copies. And I, and I have, I'm very, very bad at promotion, uh, self-promotion or anything. Like I, I just I just do the music and I don't do the other stuff. And so nobody really knows about it, but I really love it. I think it's great. And I'm very happy that it uh, exists. Right, exactly. You can't take that back anyway. Um, no. Also in, in towards the end of 82, your guitar was stolen. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you getting these, uh, these uh, factoids? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that I I have that my guitar now. Uh -huh. That's my only guitar now. How it's did, a how 1974 did, Martin Five. How did you find it? How, how did you find it? Well, St. John's is not a very big city, and uh, that guitar was stolen uh, the closing night of Tempest. In fact. And uh, I didn't have much hope for it because the case was in the van and the guitar was taken out of the case. Mm. So um, we were leaving to go on tour. Uh, we were leaving to go to the States, uh, Arizona, I think. And um, I put an ad in the paper and said a reward for, uh, you know, that the guitar was stolen. I gave a, a, an offer for a reward. And uh, whoever, so somebody bought the guitar on the waterfront for $35. And because I'm a uh, rhythm player, some of the um, finish was scratched off of the, uh, around the sound hole. So mm -hmm. whoever bought it, brought it to a guitar guy to get the finish re refinished. And uh, his name was Jimmy Lineger. And Jimmy said, where did you get this? And he said, well, I bought it on the waterfront. He said, I know who owns this. Yeah, this is stolen property. So um, oh. so I gave, uh, Jimmy gave the guy who bought my guitar a, a $100 guitar for the reward money. And uh, I got my guitar back and everybody was happy. 
And I still have that guitar. That's the guitar I use. It's a beautiful Sunburst 74 Martin D35. Wow. Well, great. You we love that. each other. <laughs> you're, you're best friends, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, we've well, been glad, through a lot together. <laughs> glad you 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 got that back. Um, that yeah, that's very interesting. Me story. too. <laughs> um, so in '83, uh, you guys uh, released "After the Tempest." Was was there any connection between that and the, and the Shakespeare score that you were working on? After uh, the well, there was a couple. There were a couple of reasons for that. Uh, yes, we uh, one song from the Tempest is on the album, and so uh, and it was after doing the Tempest, but it was also in 1982 the Ocean Ranger disaster happened. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but that was an oil rig that went down with all hands after a big storm. Mm. I think there was 82 men lost on that, and uh, so there was that Tempest as well. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I guess. Just a couple of reasons, yeah. A dual meaning there. Uh, yeah. Three of my favorites on that album are A Sailor Courted a Farmer's Daughter, Thomas and Nancy, and Auntie Mary Brothers Jig. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm not usually one that likes jigs very much, but uh, I, do, I do like that Brothers yeah. Jig. Yeah. I'm more for ballads myself, but, but, but that's a nice addition to that song so. yeah um moving forward a little bit um talk a little bit about the movie 1986 movie the adventures of faustus big bid good i, I want to say big good bid good how did you come to write music for this we were just asked to uh that was like a a collaborative project uh like you know our our community in St. John's is pretty tight knit, you know, people, everybody knows each other. So I don't know of anybody who didn't contribute to that movie. So uh, we wrote, you know, uh, some some songs for it. And one of them uh, actually uh, turned into the streets of the night, which is on one of my albums. Yes. yes. So uh, it's just, you know, everybody was everybody did something on that movie. It's a great movie. A great movie. Uh, what was the? Uh, I, I I take it that it wasn't really released um, broadly. Uh, did it? Was it just locally released or the the actual? I movie? actually don't. I can't oh. answer that question. I don't know. I don't. I don't really know what happened to the movie. Well, in a couple of years later, uh, Finding Mary March, you composed for this one also. Now, now, yeah. yeah. Now talk. Now, now this is a historical figure, right? Who was Mary March? Um, she was one of the last. I mentioned earlier having done a play in high school about the uh, indigenous people of Newfoundland uh, who were were all killed. Um, so Mary March was one of the last of those, and I have always had an interest from from the early days when I did the play in high school in that subject matter. So I was hired to help write this score. Myself and Paul Steffler wrote that score. Do you, do you recall any uh, reaction to to the movie or or your score at all from the public? Or no. Not really. I I don't tend to follow, follow things that closely. Um, Mary March is uh, is actually the it's just the um, the English name they gave her. Her name was uh, Demasdui. But uh, yeah, it was. I mean, it was interesting while I was doing it. I, but I don't really know what happened to it after. <laughs> well, that must have been a, like you said, interesting working on. Um, you know a different uh what am i trying to say uh rather than music you know actual score for a movie you know that must have been a little bit interesting for you it is interesting it's fascinating work i really enjoy it i, I haven't done as much of it as i'd like to but I fell behind in terms of uh, technology because in like most of the people who get the film work they they are better equipped to um compose uh, with with equipment, you know, like to do their own engineering and to put the scores together. I never ever had the money for that or 
uh, really the aptitude. I'm not very good with uh, buttons. Uh, I mean, I know how it all works, but I, I, I think I'm just not interested. So I never really, uh, I never went that way uh, as much as I probably could have or, or would have liked to, because I never developed the technical skills. Technical skills or interest in that, right? Um, your next album for uh, Figgy Duff was Weather Out the Storm. Um, a few tracks that I like on there are Woman of Labrador. I like Noel's drumming. Now, is that a Bodron? B-O-D-H? Yeah. Okay, okay. I like it. It's, it's tribal. It's like it has a tribal, but a soft kind of tribal. You know, yeah. I, I knew it was something, a different instrument there. I, I really, that was very effective on that song. Um, and then the title track is, is very good, Weather Out the Storm. Um, yeah. And it's a little more, a little more rocking. Yeah. At, at, on that track rumble very nice instrumental and again with the jig at the end that, you know that's acceptable <laughs> and do, then, do, you, do you not recognize that rumble is uh just slowed down the jig at the end is just a faster of the slow part the slow part yes 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 i did notice parts of it so the slow part is just rumble slow right slow and then you yeah. pick tempo at the end yeah and then, and then snowy night uh i like the tempo speaking of tempo i like i like the tempo on that song that's an, that's another nice one yeah. um the next year um uh, this is my this is my favorite uh of course i just recently really listened to a lot of this material but the color of amber with anita best uh gorgeous album um there's not a song i don't like on that one a great harmonizing throughout the the album um your voices are crystal clear um my top three favorites in no particular order she's like the swallow again gorgeous the two sisters and brave marin is it marin bravo marin bravo brava brava see brava marin yeah yeah so, but again, I like every song on that, on that album. It's, it's a wonderful album. Uh, yeah, I like that one too. Um, and then we move on to Downstream from 1993. Now this is the last one with Noel, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, True or False has beautiful vocals on that track. And then I'll probably pronounce this one wrong. Uh, Alan, Alanad, Alanad? Alanad? Alana. 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 Okay. What is Alana. that? Alana. It's a Gaelic word for child. Okay. Yeah. All right. But that's another another nice track on that one. And then um, we move on to your 1996 album, On a Wing and a Prayer. Uh, now, this was your first solo album, correct? Yeah. Okay. Okay. On a Wing and a Prayer. I like The Game, Backseat, um, Streets of the Night. There you go. You mentioned that. And a great, great rendition of Blackwater Side. Um, I also like Ann Briggs' version of, of that one. Who's? Ann Briggs. I'm not familiar yeah. with it. Yeah, she's uh, prevalent in the, popular in the 70s. Um, she worked a little bit with um, uh, Bert Bert Jansch, Bert Jansch, okay, of um, uh, yeah, on some of his material, and and I think he wrote for her too. Um, but but look that search that out. Uh, Ann Briggs, A N N E B R I G G S. Ann Briggs. Look up some of her material. I think you'll like it. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about. Um, Vive La Rose, Emile Benoit. I said that right, right? Benoit. Yeah. Uh, and how, how did that how did that album come about? Well, Emile was a friend of ours. We used to play together sometimes, and uh, he, he was a great uh, fiddle player, very unique. He came. His background is uh, Scottish and French mix, with I think a little bit of uh, Mi'kmaq in there as well, like you know, uh, jazz guitar. And um, he was a great spirit and we were really good friends. And, you know, we just thought he should have another album. He had a couple, but they were 
not as uh, lively as this one. And I think we captured his uh, spirit uh, on that record um, and did it justice. So I really like that album. It is, it is a great album also. Um, seven years from uh, 2003, uh, there's a few songs there. I'd like, like to hear your comments on those. Will You Drive? I like the guitar in that one. Is that a steel guitar? Can't remember. Yes, I believe uh, there's pedal steel from yeah. Kenny Greer. Yeah. Because yeah. it almost has that country and western flavor. Yeah. yeah. Really nice, though. Stay uh, beautiful. Love your wispy, breathy, breathy vocals on <laughs> <Okay. laughs> that one. <laughs> and then the title track is a great song. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think probably my favorite, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I think probably my favorite though is the last track out west. That's 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 oh, another, yeah. you know. I love the lyrics in that one. Yeah. How were your uh albums uh received up to this point? Were were you getting some um positive response from either critics or the public? I, uh, none of my albums ever got any marketing. So really there was nothing, I mean, yeah, they didn't sell very well. Uh, there was nobody behind them. I just made them, but I didn't, you know, there was, there was nothing done about them or for them. So no, there was really nothing. I didn't send them out for review. I didn't enter them into, I'm a little bit jaded about the whole music industry, uh, award shows, things. I don't, I don't enter, I don't buy it and I don't promote. So I probably should, but I don't, I had never have. So really they're just albums that I put out and never followed up on. So. Well, you've got to be proud of, of your work though on that and the, and the, and the musicians that you worked with as well. Um, mm. Ancestral songs from 2005. Now, are these uh, all old traditional folk ballads on this one? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, a bark, is that B-A-R-Q-U-E, a bark in the harbor? All right. Okay. A bark is a type of boat. Yeah. Okay. 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 And early spring. Is, is really nice. And I'll hang my harp. Great acapella on that one. Yeah, that's that's a really nice one also. Uh, and then and then um did you want to say something? Go ahead. No, no, okay. just sounds interesting. <laughs> okay. Um play on from um 2013, a hundred miles alike. Um Prince of Darkness, again the flute. I guess the flute, if if done right. That's one of my favorite instruments. Um, and then lonely. On lonely, is that a, a dulcimer in there? Do you do you recall? There is dulcimer, yeah. Uh, wait a minute. I think I don't think there's a there's a whistle on that too, a B flat whistle, which is one of my favorites. It's a it's a low one, right? Mm -hmm, right, right. I think I picked that up as well. Um, yeah. And then travelers again, your wispy vocals on on that <laughs> one <laughs> are nice too. Um, talk a little bit about ooze, a wetland story. Uh, so it's like a retelling of the Frog Prince fairy tale. Well, it was loosely based on the Frog Prince at the beginning, but now it's kind of morphed into something a little bit different. I mean. Uh, in the Frog Prince fairy tale, we don't really get to see why the prince was turned into a frog. But uh, in in my story, um, it's it's very obvious. The reason he gets sent to the wetlands is so that he can see firsthand what he's what the de destruction of the wetlands is doing to the creatures. And the person who sends them there is the medicine woman who could very well be a native elder. So she's casting a spell on him to send him to the wetlands, turns him into a frog. So that now it could be like an Alice in Wonderland thing. It might just be a big drug trip. We don't know. But, you know, it's a trip where he goes as a as a frog 
to the wetlands to, to see exactly what the implications are on the wetland creatures of the construction of a hydro dam. So that's basically the story. And it's it's loosely based on frog prints, but really it's more like a um like a trip, you know, a journey. Okay. Yeah, a, a modern Alice in Wonderland. Um pretty much, yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Um the White Fleet Suite. Um is this still a work in progress? Yep. Okay. Uh, when did you discover the story of the White Fleet? Um, I've always well, liked... I, uh, I, said, I, oh. I went to went to when I went to St. John's, the White Fleet was there. Like the whole the whole waterfront, as I mentioned earlier about Art Stoyles, who played a lot of Portuguese tunes. Uh, you know, they were, St. John's was their second home. They were fishing off the Grand Banks. And if there was a storm or if they needed supplies, they'd all come into St. John's Harbor. So I remember that from when I first went to St. John's, I was totally fascinated. It was beautiful. You know, just all of these gorgeous sailing vessels and these really right. handsome men playing soccer and, you know, drinking <laughs> wine and smoking exotic cigarettes and just, you know, I mean, it was fabulous. I, I remember it. And uh, I just, you know, there was a, I, I made a, a friends with a Portuguese person and uh, went to Portugal a fair, fair few times over the years, uh, you know, sort of investigating because I always loved the music and the language. So this uh, suite is a tribute to those times and the, and the um, the culture we shared, you know, like the hand lining card and the, the whole sort of connection between Newfoundland and Portugal through the fishery. Right. I, that's always been as, uh, interested me is um, the, the trade routes that, that, you know, different countries used to take, you know, and going from one country to another, they had to cross large bodies of water. And I, I love that that history of that. Uh, sea stories I've always liked and shanties, the, the, the songs, the sea shanties. Yeah. And in my research, I've discovered about the Volta do Mar, which is uh, the Portuguese word for the trade winds and how you had to follow certain currents like it, you, it's not as simple as uh, sailing west to try to, f to get from Europe to North America because you have to follow the winds and uh, you know uh, the Portuguese were the first ones to figure that out like you know how to follow the trade winds and get over to I mean they were in Newfoundland in the 1400s and long before like John Cabot didn't discover Newfoundland <laughs> And uh, that's what they all say, but that's because he was he was working for the British. He was Italian, but he was sent by the English. But, you know, the Portuguese were there long before him. But that whole sort of currents and winds and, you know, how, how they all work and how it all goes is fascinating to me as well. And I've learned a lot in my research about this project. That, that's, I, I love history myself. Um, not so much dates, remembering I remember when I was in school, I didn't like that part of the exams, what date was it, but the stories and, you know, learning from history, you know, and hopefully so we don't make the same mistakes, but we oftentimes do over and over and over. <laughs> but um, that's another story. Um, the Nobleman's Wedding, uh, a folk opera, right? You must have done, a, speaking of research, a lot of research into the oral history of, of your land for this one. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I've i done, that's my life's work. I, I went around Newfoundland learning songs from older people, most of which had never been recorded. And so uh, the Nobleman's Wedding, I'm using all of these gorgeous melodies I found plus little bits of bits of pieces of various stories and put them all together to make one story and using various all the melodies that I learned mm -hmm. yeah so that's that's a labor of love and and it's an ongoing thing I never was again never was able to get it off the ground the way I wanted it to because I'm a hopeless business person and I'm a, like I just don't know how to 
get money or resources or promotion or any of those things. I just never figured that out. I'm I'm pretty good at music, but I'm hopeless at business. <laughs> so I never could get that thing happening. But hopefully someday I will. At least I will have it. Uh, I will. I haven't been able to have a recording of it, but there is a um, a score, a mm -hmm. notated score of that piece in existence. So, you know, maybe someone who's better at it than I am will someday, you know, be able to make it work. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a passion project for me. And, and, and it's, it's my way of, I think, uh, I, so many, like, I feel the, um, the people who taught me these songs, I mean, most of them are dead now. Uh, but I feel a responsibility like towards them. And I, I, you know, in this day and age, most people don't have the um, the listening skills or the concentration to listen to a, you know, 20 verse valid ballad, well, with the exception of people like yourself. But generally speaking, <laughs> people aren't, you know, into it. So right. yeah, it's a way to use parts of these stories and parts of and make it interesting and to keep them alive in a way that hopefully will be you know uh have broader appeal and broader um you know uh interest uh, people will will be interested and be able to hear them in a way that you know they wouldn't ordinarily be able to do you know without having to listen to you know a, a forever to a ballad so it's a way of utilizing the music and the stories in a way that you know hopefully will have a broader appeal right right well it reminds me a little bit of uh, john lomax who who went back you know into the uh southern states Oh, he, when was that? What when he would record these old folk tunes and soul, you know, and blues tracks, um, you know, and and get these and I, and he he actually re put them on put them on record, but it's like some of these old uh, folk songs from you know deep in uh, America, you know, uh, especially in the South, and and he uh, helped document that. So that's you know I always uh, you know say you know. I mean that that that's that should be really uh, rewarded in some some facet or some way for somebody to keeping keeping that history alive like that. I think that's wonderful. Wonderful that you do that. So, yeah. uh, would anything else that you'd like to talk about or mention or at this point? No, nothing <laughs> specific. Uh, yeah. You think? Um, it's been interesting I, to get your uh, take on the albums. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, history that I had forgotten about. I don't know where you dug it up. <laughs> uh, <just laughs> mostly, mostly internet. All, all those things. Internet research. Uh, mostly uh, internet research. There. Some, somebody's going to, uh, you know, document that. Again, talking about that somewhere on some blog or something. Um, you know, like with the with the uh, purse. I mean, uh, with your with your guitar, your guitar. So um, yeah, yeah. So you know, I I enjoy I enjoy doing this. It's it's rewarding to me, you know, to get your input and and the people that I'm talking to. And like you mentioned, you know, I had well, I get a lot of reactions. Like I hadn't thought about that in years. You know, well, it's <laughs> it's yeah, dust, exactly. Dust off, dust off some of those cobwebs. You know. And uh, that's why I like to talk about the early years, you know, your upbringing and that kind of stuff, because that's, that's the formative years. That's what, you know, led you to, uh, you know, music and, you know, all that matters. You know, I don't, I don't want to just talk about the releases and the albums and that kind of stuff, but you know, I have a whole spectrum of, uh, of what's going on in your life. So. Where anyway. did you get the uh, the name for your uh, oh. attending the pale blue? Right, right. Well, I think that. Thank you for asking. Um, that's uh, basically um, what the focus of of you know the videos, and I also have the written site as well. Um, is taking a pale bloom you know, that may need some watering 
and may need some nurturing and 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 helping you know feed that and help bring about some some possible some growth and helping to bring it you know more into full blossom um, through music you know and and so a, a lot of the other you know different artists that I talk to maybe they were popular at, at some time in the past and maybe they just need a little dusting off you know a little a little refresher a little spritzer <laughs> you know if, if you will and nurturing you know and bringing together uh, like-minded you know people uh, hopefully waking up some other uh, people out there that may not have known they were interested in this, but then exposing that, you know, to a broader audience, that kind of thing. So, so that's what tending the pale bloom is, is, um, you know, hopefully just uh, bringing that awareness of, of the musician and, and his work and his art to a broader audience and then hoping, hoping to bring more like-minded people together, you know, through that. So, yeah. That's Thanks. a lovely name. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and a, and a nice concept. I, I I kind of thought it was well, you know, it 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 indicates something like you described. So it's right. nice, great name. Yeah, I I appreciate that. All right. Well, um, I can't think of anything else. L let me ask you real quick. What's uh on the immediate horizon for uh for Pamela Morgan? I'm still working at the uh on the uh, white fleet i'm still working on uh ooze and i'm trying to get funding for both of those so they're both those projects are incomplete so i'm just trying to fix them you know finish them the best way i can okay all right yeah. all right well i do appreciate your time pamela and um like i said i'll let you know as soon as i get it edited so you can take a look at it okay. Thank right. you for your interest. Thanks for getting in touch. I've enjoyed oh. it. Bye-bye. Take good care. Bye mm -hmm. now. Take care.